quick overview of the post-World War II surplus weapons trade and how intel agencies were supposed to be monitoring that, the most vital and dangerous one being nuclear weapons, of course. Both sides, the USSR and USA, kind of looked the other way or even covertly assisted when arms went to factions they felt ideologically were beneficial to their global ambitions. If Turkey is to have the assistance it needs, the United States must supply it. We are the only country able to provide that help. From now on, it means that anti-communist America will make its influence felt in European affairs. The U.S., however, had one exception, and that is when it went against its own interests regarding Egypt and the vital Suez Canal because of Israeli pressure groups. This led to the Suez Crisis, or War of 56, which made Israel decide, at any cost or risk, that it had to have the bomb. World War II, the deadliest war, culminated with the deadliest weapon, the atomic bomb. Our B-29s dropped two atomic bombs. Which hastened the surrender of Japan. The bomb which wiped out hundreds of thousands of people instantly and left life-destroying radiation in its wake to plague the innocent for generations. Never had a weapon annihilated a city and its people in seconds. The whole world saw the demonstration. The European powers recognized the Americans had then declared themselves the new superpower. It was a new world order. An iron curtain has descended across the continent. Ladies and gentlemen, the United States stands at this time at the pinnacle of world power. An awe-inspiring accountability to the future. A new problem emerged in peacetime. The weapons surplus across continents was no longer necessary. Some weapons used in the beginning of the war had been made obsolete and were replaced with more advanced models by the end of the war. Black markets for illegal as well as legal arms trades thrived. The OSS had morphed into the CIA. Other states had created likewise counterparts. The age of intelligence agencies and covert war had come. One of the first responsibilities of these new agencies was tracking and preventing weapons proliferation. The other was protecting weapons technology secrets. The goal of both was to keep these powerful weapons out of the hands of bad actors, and nothing was more safeguarded or sacred than preventing nuclear weapons proliferation. Well, at least that's how it should have been. Not everyone in America put American interests first, and with the right bribes, threats, and political pressure, criminal syndicates realized they could get away with anything. In the decades preceding the creation of Israel in 1948, which carved away huge swaths of Palestine, Haganah and Palmach Zelots engaged in a campaign of terrorism. Making a majority Jewish demographic in Palestine was imperative. Of course, the horrors of World War II for European Jews accelerated migration to Palestine. There was even, up until 1939, an agreement with the National Socialists in Germany and the Zionist Jewish Agency called Havara Agreement, or the Transfer Agreement, which was to send Jews to Palestine. Britain tried to limit this, but they had their hands full with World War II. Jewish terrorist groups took advantage and attacked British targets and personnel in Palestine. They also smuggled weapons and a lot of dynamite into the country. The Jewish agency which smuggled weapons and people into what becomes Israel would also comprise the leadership of the first Israeli government in preparation for war to maintain their annexation of land in addition to human trafficking. The Jewish agency had sophisticated arms smuggling operation that stretched deep into the United States. 
After World War II and the Holocaust, the Jewish Agency slash Haganah were a politically sensitive and difficult faction to prosecute. Also because of Jewish identity politics, many American Jews in positions of influence were Israeli nationalists and looked the other way or even assisted in the smuggling post-World War II weapons surplus out of the United States to Israel. The Zionist plot to take Palestine predates World War II, so it cannot be said to be a reaction to the Holocaust. The confidence Zionists gain in the proven reliability of Sanem assets inside the U.S. during the decades preceding the creation of Israel propelled the first new government of Israel to continue smuggling operations out of the United States. The United States seemed unwilling to prosecute them, which in part emboldened the chutzpah to a level of nuclear theft. If the smuggling had been stopped at TNT, it never would have escalated to uranium. The operation had three types of players, smugglers, financiers, and the political cover-up. The Zionists hone in on the War Assets Administration, which is where the Americans would be decommissioning a vast array of weapons. The US government made strict arms export controls, so illegal procurement and trafficking had to be created. To get the weapons from the WAA they desired, the terrorists would have to have organization, finance, a method of acquisition and transportation. The organization was the Sonborn Group, a stateside nexus of Jewish supremacist millionaires who worked hand in glove with the Jewish agency in Haganah. Finance came from wealthy partisans, false charities, and organized crime. Acquisition had several means, either by purchasing decommissioned weapons and repurposing them, theft or procurement through a third party. For example, a Latin American country not under restriction could buy arms, which it purchased, and then divert them to Haganah for a bribe or a kickback. Transport came by front companies falsely labeling arms as legitimate goods or by hiding weapons inside legitimate goods. Sometimes they delivered them by flying or freighting contraband over themselves. On July 1st, 1945, a group of wealthy American Jews met with the leadership of the Jewish organization to organize a money laundering and arms smuggling operation out of the United States. The Jewish agency was preparing for war in Palestine. They met at the New York penthouse of Rudolf Sonborn, where they became the Sonborn Group, comprised of 40 men. They also formed the Sonborn Institute. On paper, this institute had the noble cause as a charity to be dedicated to the relief of European Jews. In reality, it was a legal cover for a money laundering operation shielded by the nearly untouchable theme of helping Holocaust victims. The irony is that it abetted the forced removal, murder, and land confiscation of another people. Haganah set up an American headquarters in Midtown Manhattan at Hotel 14. The basement of the hotel was the famous nightclub Coca Cabana, run by Meyer Lansky and ally Italian mob boss Frank Costello. The extent that Israel and the Jewish Mafia would work together is so expansive that you can't tell where one stops and the other begins. The July 1st, 1945 meeting under Rudolf Sonborn was a who's who of Jewish agency leadership, Haganah, wealthy American Zionists, and Mafia contacts. At the meeting was of course the head organizer, Rudolf Sonborn, as well as Henry Montour, the director of United Jewish Appeal, later to be run by Charles Bronfman. His father was mafioso Samuel Bronfman, the co-founder of United Liquor, the manager of which was James Hensley, the father-in-law of John McCain, whose own father helped cover up the USS Liberty attack. John McCain's advisor, John Weaver of the Lincoln Project, was wrapped up in a pedophile scandal. Maybe can get a job as a producer at CNN. Charles Bronfman's brother, Edgar Bronfman Sr., was the president of the World Jewish Congress. His son, Edgar Bronfman Jr., is involved in financing Jeffrey Epstein, a pedophile, and his two daughters helped finance the next same cult of Keith Rainier, also a pedophile. The executive chairman for the Jewish Appeal under Henry Montour 
was none other than Rabbi Herbert Friedman, the founding president of the Wexner Heritage Foundation. If you're thinking, wait, that Les Wexner? Yes, from the Mega Group, the one that acted as the financial backbone for Jeffrey Epstein and gave money to Israeli prime ministers, set up the Wexner Foundation, which Jeffrey Epstein was a trustee of. This Les Wexner, accused of having girls raped on his property. He is a hardcore Zionist, gave Epstein a house, and helped set up the entire operation for Epstein and Maxwell, whose father was a spy for Israel. What a bunch. Acosta was told back off their intelligence. Gee, I wonder which organization they could be talking about. I guess it's Iran. In tandem with the smuggling and the bribing was also a syndicate for blackmail. From Mickey Cohen to Epstein, the playbook never changed. Compromise and control. Most prominent there was David Ben-Gurion, the chairman of the Jewish Agency and later Prime Minister of Israel. Abba Hillel Silver, chairman of the U.S. section of the Jewish Agency. Teddy Kulik, a.k.a. Nasser Ben Natan, the executive secretary of the Jewish Agency and the future mayor of Jerusalem. Yehuda Arazi, who had many names. The Haganah chief arms producer and purchaser. Leonard Wiseman, who set up a number of front companies for transportation, including Minerals Redistribution Company, Paragon Design and Development Corp, the Pratt Steamship Line, and with Nahum Bernstein, the Foundry Associates Incorporation, which was a company that only existed on paper. There was Sam Sloan, a scrap metal deal networker, who had multiple scrapyards across the nation. Not all weapons were decommissioned in the same way, so it was possible to mix and match and create lethal weapons. Eli Shalit, who moved arms from New York to Palestine. Samuel Zamuri, who had many contacts, especially in Latin America. He was also the largest shareholder of United Fruit, which is deeply tied to the CIA. Rovun Daphne of Haganah, who was the liaison to organized crime in the United States, including Sammy Kay of the Mafia in Miami, who had liaisons to figures in Latin America. Other prominent Mafia figures working with Haganah and the Jewish Agency were Abner Zwillman, who ran the New Jersey ports, Meyer Lansky and Albert Anastasia, who controlled the longshoremen and ran the docks in New York, Mickey Cohen and Mo Dallitz, who raised over a million dollars for Ergun terrorists, Babyface, Bugsy Siegel, and others. The Sunborn Group predates the Mega Group, but that was birthed out of this organization. More on that later. Sammy Kay was good friends with the president of Panama. He allowed Haganah-owned ships to carry the flag of Panama as they were shipping weapons illegally to what would become Israel. Yehuda Abazari, the Haganah chief arms purchaser, worked with the New York Mafia to transport arms to Israel through Zim shipping. These same docks would later be used to move the uranium, often packing different types of weapons inside legitimate goods like boilers and mislabeled products. This gambit would escalate into the theft of uranium from Apollo, Pennsylvania. The Zionists worked with the dictator of Nicaragua, Anastasio Somoza Garcia, and his son. Ted Kulik acquired $8 million, as well as arms, from Somoza. Nicaragua had been occupied from 1912 to 1933 by the United States. Somoza openly gave land grants to gold and other minerals to the U.S. in exchange for favorable allowances on purchasing surplus weapons. This was diverted to the Israeli state. A similar gambit happened in Cuba, where weapons meant for anti-communist Cubans ended up in the hands of Israelis, and it greatly affected the outcome of the Bay of Pigs when no uprising occurred because no weapons were actually there. Loyal to the sun, the Zionists continued the relationship with Anastasio Somoza de Bale on up until 79, and then again working with the United States through Iran-Contra by covertly supporting the Contras against the Santanistas, which were who 
ousted the Somoza dictatorship family. Bo Dalitz, another prominent figure in the Jewish mafia, was an early business partner with Abe Bernstein of the murderous Purple Gang. They used to murder motorists for sport. That didn't bother the ADL. 1985, they gave Mo an award. Mo would become the mob boss of Cleveland, even though most of his operations would move and center on Vegas. His businesses, however, were all over the United States. Dallas was not only a close confidant of Meyer Lansky, the two co-owned the Frolic Club in Miami. The Desert Inn Casino also took investments from convicted illegal arms smuggler Hank Greenspun, who was not only invested in, but also became a publicist there as well. He owned the Las Vegas Sun and pulled a money laundering scheme with advertising that was similar to what Boris Berzovsky repeated in Russia. Prior to that, he'd been a publicist for another mafia casino, the Flamingo, which was run by Lansky's childhood friend and murderer Bugsy Siegel, who himself accumulated $50,000 for Haganah. Greenspun's wife was given top honors by the ADL. Her husband attempted to smuggle 22 Pratt & Whitley R2-800 low airplane engines to Palestine when Haganah terrorist group was creating the State of Israel through ethnic cleansing. After jury tampering with the sole Jewish juror meeting with the defense, Greenspun and two of his cohorts, William Sosno and Samuel Lewis were acquitted, but his other partners, Adolf Schwimmer, Leon Gardner, Reynolds Selk and Abraham Levin were convicted. The Greenspun would be found guilty of smuggling the machine guns that would go with the planes as well as artillery and ammo. He stole 30 and 50 caliber machine guns from Hawaii and shipped them to Haganah in Palestine through Mexico. This he did working with Nathan Lift. Essentially what they did was move decommissioned weapons from one side of the yard to another, pulling a switch so that weapons that had not been decommissioned ended up in the hands of the Israelis. When he was indicted, Greenspun tried to bribe his way out. He offered $25,000 to Seth Solomon Pope or anyone else designated by Pope to squash a second Neutrality Act indictment against him. Solomon worked in Hawaii at the War Assets Administration in charge of decommissioning and selling off World War II surplus. He was most likely the original contact for the smuggling. The man was investigated three times for fraudulent sales. They also stole over 500 machine gun barrels. Reportedly, Hank took an additional 10% kickback from the arms sales he made. A grand jury in Los Angeles indicted Hank on six other counts of violating the Neutrality Act and Export Control Law, Title 50 United States Code Section 701 and Title 22 United States Code Section 452. However, he only got a $10,000 fine and no jail time. Greenspun was paid through the SSC. The SSC was a front for the AJDC's Lishka, which financed communists and Bercha illegal immigration. The Jewish Agency, which was the government in waiting for the organized terrorist groups that formed Israel, facilitated the cash flow to gun runners like Hank. In concealed in the open receipts of international clandestine Jewish aid in early 50s Hungary, Zachary Paul Levine of Yeshef University Museum writes, quote, The JDC Israeli collaboration that formed around clandestine immigration to Israel and welfare to migrants filled the vacuum with the creation of two institutions. The first created in 1952 by the Israeli government's Liaison Bureau of Israel Ministry of Foreign Affairs, or Lishka by its Hebrew acronym, which collected information and administered individual aid. The second was created in Switzerland in 1953, known as the Society of Mutual Aid, SSE by its French acronym. This organization directed AJDC funds to Lishka and represented Jewish aid providers' interest in the communist governments. However, as an American organization at the height of the McCarthy Red Scare, AJDC administrators could hardly justify the appearance of sending cash or material into a state which the U.S. was technically engaged in economic warfare. In March of 1953, the AJDC and Lishka together established the SSC, a paper organization that covered the AJDC's Israeli partnership and provided a means for regularized AJDC funding for Lishka from the Joint Relief and Transit budget that funded activities that might have contravened U.S. law. The SSE Swiss chairman, Erwin Heyman, had years of experience channeling money from the U.S. for Birch and other clandestine activities. One traveled through the SSE onto Lishka agents who received U.S. dollars or other Western currencies and exchanged them into Hungarian forints. 
on the black market in Vienna. Subsequently, the Florence traveled via diplomatic pouch or in suitcase of an apparent traveler to the legation in Budapest whose staff distributed the cash around the country." End quote. We learn from declassified FBI documents that Erwin Heyman, the same man aiding communists on behalf of the Jewish agency, is who made three transfers of $1.3 million to Hank Greenspun. Greenspun would later become the Western Director of Bonds for Israel. Heyman sent payments to Banco del Alvaro, Mexico by cable. Interesting because $1.3 million is exactly how much Modalit sank into the Desert Inn Casino, which Greenspun was the publicist for and invested in. What a coincidence. If you're into Kennedy research, here's a cookie for you. Hungarian Jew Timor Rosenbaum is the bridge between Meyer Lansky and Erwin Heyman and heavy Florida-Cuba crime syndicate. But we'll put that on the side for now. United Israel Appeal takes tax dollars from the U.S. State Department's Migration and Refugee Assistance Account to resettle Jews who are not refugees to Israel. And of course, they give money to the Jewish agency. So effectively, the State Department is financing the Jewish agency through Israeli affiliate organizations. Discussing Al Schwimmer, Hank Greenspun, and some of these other crooks with me from the Institute of Research in Middle Eastern Policies, Grant F. Smith. Israel Aerospace Industries, although no one ever mentions it, has been doing this for decades. Um, they were founded by a convicted felon who made his bones by obtaining Lockheed Constellation aircraft for pennies on the dollar after World War II and turning it into a smuggling airline that successfully created a Panamanian front company for uh, a number of these planes and then collapsed it and flew them overseas to smuggle arms from Czechoslovakia to Palestine. And so that's the founder of this company. Later, they were involved in uh, stealing uh, dassault plans for their jet fighter and, and helping Israel create its own platform. Rooms of plans, you know, just giant quantities of plans. They were involved in Iran-Contra in some aspects. They were involved in, in all sorts of things. And so... And a lot uh, of those guys from both Iran-Contra and from, from the ZOA guys got pardoned after being caught. Well, absolutely. Uh, Al Schwimmer... Uh, was pardoned relatively soon. What you see in the documentary record is that uh, some of the early smugglers who were smuggling for the you know War of Independence in the 40s, um, Al Schwimmer, Hank Greenspun, Charles Winters, all of these people uh, later received presidential pardons. But they were definitely crooks. And Al, uh, Hank Greenspun, uh, who later went into the publishing uh, business in Las Vegas, uh, his FBI report says that uh, they were involved in bribing jurors to get uh, lighter sentences. And, and in this case, he never went to prison and later got a pardon. So there's a whole lot of corruption involved in the fact that such major arms traffickers, you know, just violating the Arms Export Control Act and you know, Neutrality Act willy-nilly, uh, never really faced any consequences, and, and indeed it helped their reputation with their foreign patrons. Things looked grim for Al, Sam, and the other defendants, but they had a secret weapon, and they didn't even know it. It was delivered accidentally by an Israeli Air Force friend, an ex-intelligence officer who was studying at UCLA. So I go down to the courthouse, and they're in the process of impaneling a jury. And I see the next prospective juror is the fellow from my speech class at UCLA who gave a very strong pro-Israel speech. So I called the attorney over and I told him about this guy and they got him on the jury. He hung the jury. <laughs> so instead of jail sentences, the deal made was that there would be only fines. So the sentencing came down and they were convicted felons, and they had a $10,000 fine each to pay, which the Jewish agency took care of. But what it meant was once you're a felon, you can't vote, you can't carry a firearm, you can't do all these other things. So that left a bit of a mar on our silk, anyhow. The only time somebody went to jail was Charlie Winters, who was a non-Jew, who got stuck in Florida. 
Charlie Winters spent 18 months in prison for selling Al two B-17s. Yeah, Charles Winters smuggled in some uh, B-17 bombers, B-17, which, you know, at that time right. was high tech. Well, it was. Uh, these things cost a quarter of a million to develop back in the day. He acquired them because he wanted to have a fruit business, you know, bringing in tropical fruit uh, between Florida. And he had sort of demilitarized some B-17s to haul cargo. Uh, but, uh, you know, those, those were still uh, very valuable in terms of being able to retrofit them and use them. And so, you know, the investigation only managed to convict a handful of people. And if it had been done right, um, if they really wanted to uphold U.S. laws, then they would have they would have literally arrested hundreds and hundreds of people, including a lot of lawyers in New York, including a lot of on the ground people all over the country. Uh, but instead, they just let it all go. And our argument is really that uh, we're in kind of the state we are today because it's now assumed that this sort of impunity is going to continue indefinitely, that you can pretty much do anything you want if you're righteous. Throughout the 1950s and most of the 60s, up until the War of 1967, Israel and France were intimate allies. Following World War II was an era of decolonization. Older European colonial powers such as Britain and France were unable to continue ruling most of their offshore colonies in Africa and Asia, many of which were waging struggles and wars for self-determination against them. In North Africa, Algeria, which was colonized by France, was by 1954 up in arms against its colonial overlord. Africa is aflame with civil war, which from day to day grows in intensity. The tide of battle shifts from Algeria to Morocco almost hourly, as completely aroused nationalist natives take on the full military might of France. Hit and run raids leave villages in flames, often with most of their inhabitants massacred. All roads are under guard and barricaded, passable only to the French military. Even as talks between Arab leaders and the French take place, the unbridled fury of the guerrilla warfare continues. With two and a half divisions deployed and French reservists called up, the rebels continue to fight, but at a cost. Already, 1,700 are dead. Not even hospitals are spared in the savage struggle. As for the non-combatants, they, as always, are the pawns in a rebellion whose seeds are sown deeply. The Algerian War would last until 1962, ending with Algerian gaining independence. Throughout the war, Israel was supporting France by providing intelligence on Algeria, and in return was sold French weaponry and other military equipment. In 1956, Israel assisted France and Britain by invading Egypt, and momentarily seized the Gaza Strip. This war in Egypt was carried out to overthrow the president, Gamal Abdel Nasser, who had nationalized the Suez Canal. The British and the French were, however, to be cognizant of the post-World War New World Order governed by the United States and the Soviet Union, who forced them to cease their aggression on Egypt. Israel likewise had to reluctantly pull back from Gaza Strip and the Sinai Peninsula in 1957 after a lot of pressure from Eisenhower. Following the failed 1956 attack on Egypt, David Ben-Gurion sent his protege, Shimon Peres, the future Prime Minister of Israel, to Paris following the war, with the mission of acquiring nuclear technology from the French, which the Israelis themselves could not develop. They made a secret deal in 1957, where the French would provide Israel with nuclear technology and associated training. Covertly, hiding in the Negev Desert, the French built a plutonium-based nuclear plant in Dimona for the Israelis. It was supposed to be kept a secret, but American U-2 spy planes would spot the unaccounted for rig in the middle of the empty desert. Israel insisted it was nothing but an innocent textile plant. The United States demanded inspections of the site. Financing of Demona was just as covertly carried out and was paid for by funding outside of Israel's official state budget. 
1958, David Ben-Gurion and Shimon Peres appointed American Zionist Jew, Haganah agent, and arms smuggler Abraham Weinberg the task of raising money from wealthy Jews from around the world to build the reactor in Demona. Among the contributors were prominent Jewish figures such as Baron Edmund Adolf the Rothschild, the wealthiest member of the Rothschild's family, Edmund Leopold the Rothschild, Baron Isaac Wolfson, Baron Marsik Sev Louis Bloomfield, Samuel Zacks, and of course, Samuel Bronfman. The collective donations which came from the Sunborn Institute to fund the reactor was coordinated by none other than Henry Morgenthau Jr., the former Secretary of U.S. Treasury and author of the genocidal Morgenthau Plan which would have killed tens of millions of Germans had it been implemented. Following Roosevelt's death in 1945, Morgenthau resigned to immediately begin working for the Zionist cause. He joined the Jewish Agency and in 1946 became chairman of the United Jewish Appeal, working alongside Henry Montour from the Sunborn Institute, who was also the executive vice president under Morgenthau and his mentor. As chairman of United Jewish Appeal, Morgenthau would, from 1946 to 1950, raise over half a billion dollars by doing fundraisers, which would go to resettling European Jews in Palestine to bolster the Jewish demographic. Morgenthau and Montour would also, alongside with Rudolf Sonborn and Ben-Gurion and others, start the sale of Israeli bonds. Morgenthau would sell bonds worth $190 million together with Montour. Feinberg and Morgenthau would raise over $40 million, which would later be used for the construction of Demona. The Sunborn Group was not just working with the criminal underworld and the Jewish agency and Haganah terrorists. They also had help from the inside. Because none of these crimes were being prosecuted, they got more and more brazen. And people like Glenn T. Seaborg, head of the Atomic Energy Commission during the JFK administration, protected Israeli theft of uranium-235 from Apollo from the FBI. Tax-exempt charitable organizations considered laser enrichment and ballistic missiles as social welfare. After the Suez Crisis, Israel was put in a do-or-die mode to steal the bomb. They had gotten away with everything else so far. So why not? America seemed completely unwilling to prosecute. This is where Zalman Shapiro and Raphael Aydin would enter the stage. NUMEC, the Nuclear Materials and Equipment Corporation, was incorporated in 1956, less than two months after the Suez Crisis. NUMEC owned the Apollo Uranium Plant in Apollo, Pennsylvania. A company called Apollo Industries invested in NUMEC. Apollo Industries was formed out of three defunct companies, the Santoy Mining Company, Apollo Steel Company, and the American Bolton Fastener Company. It was a den of Zionists. Their directors were Ivan J. Novik, a future Zionist Organization of America president, and David Lowenthal, a refugee smuggler for Israel who fought in the 1956 war. The FBI has photographs of him shaking hands with David Ben-Gurion, and Moshe Dayan. Lowenthal's partner was Dr. Zalman Shapiro, the president of NUMEC, and also the Zionist Organization of America chapter president of Pennsylvania. The diversion of highly enriched uranium to Israel started ASAP. Uranium-235 with 97.7% enrichment was supplied by Portsmouth to NUMEC to be used in the Nautilus program for nuclear submarines, a technology Shapiro helped to develop. Some of that, according to a NUMEC employee who witnessed it, was hidden in food irradiator trucks.
It would then be loaded onto Zim's ships and sent to Israel. They used the same mafia-run docks, the Sonborn Group, with its Camarilla of Haganah terrorists and Jewish agency leadership had used to smuggle conventional weapons for Israel's first war and earlier acts of terrorism. These people had blown up boats full of people, hotels, railways, and embassy, and tossed grenades through the windows of Palestinian houses. They were now leading the government of Israel. Lowenthal's buddy Ben-Gurion had simultaneously been the first prime minister and defense minister of Israel, up until something caused him to resign in 1963. The Kennedys suspected Israel had illegal nuclear weapons. They sent inspectors to Dimona, where Israel did and still does have a nuclear plant used to make highly enriched uranium for weapons. In addition to inspecting Dimona, both Kennedys were going after the Zionist American Council, or Zionist Organization of America, trying to register it under FARA. That was a do-or-die situation for Israel. 1962, November 21st, the Department of Justice, under Robert Kennedy, orders the American Zionist Council to register under FARA, the Foreign Agents Registration Act. The American Zionist Council makes excuses and asks for an extension. Grant S. Smith, director of the Institute for Research, Middle Eastern Policy, recounts how the World Zionist Organization and the American Zionist Council avoid FARA seven times with the issue finally being dropped after the death of Robert Kennedy as the new Attorney General's and head of the Justice Department, without any legal reasoning, put an end to the investigation. There was a clear connection between uh, organizations claiming to be harmless uh, nonprofits like the Zionist Organization of America and the arms smuggling. You have the Justice Department uh, and State Department, with it, which administered the Foreign Agents Registration Act, uh, for seven separate occasions, ordering this this organization to register as a foreign agent since they were under the control of the World Zionist Organization. And yet, as you said, they made a deal with the top person of justice. And, uh, you know, that really shows how political uh, DOJ attorney generals are. Uh, made him basically uh, overrule the staff attorneys and the career people, as I'm sure never ever happens here in Washington, but hmm. overrule them, kind of stab them in the back and say, you know what, ZOA doesn't have to register. In 1963, in January, Isaiah L. Kinnan incorporates the American Israeli Public Affairs Committee in Washington, D.C. The same year, 1963, JFK tells Israeli Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion that Israel will not be allowed to have nuclear weapons. Israel builds a nuclear facility in Dimona anyway. Kennedy demands inspections. Israel lies to the U.S., even going as far as building another phony plant for them to inspect. Israel acquired yellow cake uranium from Argentina. Canadian intelligence got wind of this and passed it on to the United Kingdom and the Americans. Everyone was well aware of it. JFK said to his advisor, Charles Barlett, about Israel and Ben-Gurion, the sons of bitches lie to me constantly about their nuclear capacity. Under pressure from JFK wanting to inspect the nukes, Ben-Gurion resigned. Levi Eshkol replaces Ben-Gurion and Kennedy goes after him as well. October 1963, the Department of Justice demands again that the American Zionist Council register under FARA. The department expects a response from you within 72 hours, RFK wrote. The following month, 1963, JFK is assassinated. In short, who and how this murder took place is highly contested.
for putting in the position I'm in. We'll never let the true facts come of our boards to the, to the world. Are these people in very high positions yet? Yes. With Lyndon Bain Johnson out of the race in March, by April of 1968, the CIA's Director of Central Intelligence, Richard Helms, together with Attorney General Ramsey Clark, investigated Zalman Shapiro. This action was supported by J. Edgar Hoover at the time. The following information outlines agency efforts to persuade the FBI to undertake an investigation of Shapiro and Numec and to keep track of its activities in this regard. On April 2, 1968, Mr. Helms sent a letter to the Attorney General urging that the FBI initiate a discreet intelligence investigation of Dr. Shapiro. Mr. Hoover had suggested this course of action. A month later, RFK was killed. By September 1969, with Nixon in office, Hoover was singing a different tune. He discontinued any further FBI investigation and pulled a 180 on his recommendations to Helms. Hoover further stated that the FBI was discontinuing any further active investigation of the case. I wonder why. It's well known what Lansky and Costello had on Hoover and Tolson. However, CIA staffers already had dead to rights physical evidence. John Hayden and Carl Duckett had done the legwork. Highly enriched uranium with a Portsmouth signature with 97.7% enrichment had been found by testing the flora outside Demona. The US was the only country with those means and the Nautilus program, U-235, at NUMEC was the only program in the world that had that level of enrichment. But Lyndon Johnson didn't want to know about it. Neither did Syndicate President Nixon. Briefings were made in 1976 to Attorney General Edward Levy by Carl Duckett and former Atomic Energy Chairman Glenn Seaborg. The internal CIA documents were not released, however, until 2015. The mass media avoided reporting on this information more than it did the coverage of the Ghislaine Maxwell trial. Regarding the cover-up, researcher Grant F. Smith explains to radio host Scott Horton. What all did the government know about the theft of this nuclear material at the time, the extent of the Israeli spy ring in America at the time, and did the government at the time just sit back and let this happen, or were they in on it, or they couldn't do anything about it, or they did do something but not enough, or what? Well, all, all of the above. When the, when the, uh, at first, the Atomic Energy Commission realized that NUMEC was losing many, 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 a much higher percentage of weapons grade uranium than any plant in America and they they focused in on it and conducted a bogus uh, crackdown in which they interviewed employees but they wouldn't take any notes and they didn't want to be embarrassed because they had a conflict of interest they were trying to promote atoms for peace and, and get nuclear businesses in America started so they didn't want to crack down on a plant they called in the FBI uh, the FBI recommended after very few years they said you know what Zalman Shapiro the owner of the plant is a national security risk all he does uh, is travel to Israel and hang out with intelligence operatives in the United States he's up to something so pull his security clearances and don't send any more nuclear material to New Mac well the Atomic Energy Commission would not do that for all of the conflicts that I just mentioned uh, and it really wasn't until the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which was, you know, a subsequent organization to the AEC, uh, in the mid-70s began trying to look at how to safeguard nuclear facilities from diversion. And they had a couple of disgruntled people 
uh, investigating it at the National uh, at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, and so to quell these disgruntled people, they invited the CIA, Carl Duckett, in to give a briefing. And Duckett said basically, yeah, uh, uranium was stolen from the United States and given to, <laughs> given to Israel. The CIA, beginning in 1966, 67, 68, thought Israel had the bomb. But they hadn't confirmed that Demona was producing plutonium. And so they charged the CIA station chief, John Haddon, and his people in Tel Aviv to make trips to Demona and collect samples in the environment. Remember the gaseous effluence. At any nuclear plant, you can pick up very small traces of radioactivity. That's why they're so closely regulated, to keep those traces uh, very small. So they were looking for plutonium in the environment. And John Haddon's son remembers going out there with his dad on peanut butter sandwich trips where the kids would eat the peanut butter sandwich and the father would collect uh, flora in the, in the vicinity, throw it in the trunk and head back to Tel Aviv. We don't know today who counted those, did the radioactive analysis of those samples, but they found highly enriched uranium b before they found plutonium. And there was no highly enriched uranium at Demona. Israel had no capability to enrich uranium. What we know today is that they were able to put a signature on that highly enriched uranium that proved that it came from the United States, that it came from the Naval Nuclear Program, because the fuel for Navy fuel for Navy reactors was 97.7 percent enriched. Uh, a little science, natural uranium, 0.7 percent. Uranium in a light water reactor, power reactor like we use, 3 percent. Uranium in a nuclear weapon, typically 93%, depending on the country. But the naval fuel was 97.7, and that's what Haddon found in the environment near Demona, the type of fuel processed by Numec. So alarming was the CIA's conclusion about Israel stealing nuclear material that Richard Helms told the founder of the CIA Science and Technology section, Carl Duckett, not to publish his report, and to go directly to the president. But the only thing Lyndon Baines Johnson seemed concerned about was making the story go away. He ordered Duckett to tell no one, not even Secretary of State Dean Rusk or the Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara. Not surprising. Numec was run by the Zionist Organization of America President the Zionist Organization of America chapter president, and the future chairman of the ADL. Johnson's own family overlap with these Jewish supremacist organizations. According to the Jerusalem Post, LBJ's aunt was in the ZOA. Also, his father and grandfather both fought for clemency for the child-murdering rapist pedophile Leo Frank. Frank had been the chapter president of B'nai B'rith in Georgia. He had child laborers working in his pencil factory, one of them a 13-year-old Mary Fagan whom he raped and murdered. The ADL was created over this case to defend Frank. It is not an anti-defamation league. The ADL is just another Zionist organization that uses the charges of anti-Semitism to defame anyone critical of Israel's state policy of ethnic cleansing. LBJ was not only a Zionist from a hardline Zionist family, he was compromised. Johnson was having an affair with an Ergun terrorist, Matilda Krim, the wife of a Johnson advisor and willing cuck, Arthur Krim. In fact, that's where he was and who he was with on the night of the outbreak of the Six-Day War. It's almost like some faction knew he was so compromised that they could even attack an American ship and murder U.S. servicemen without consequence. Oh, and they did. And once again, LBJ, other than grabbing his ankles for Israel, did little other than issuing a gag order on the American survivors. Wow, somebody really wanted Kennedy out and LBJ in. I guess it was Cuba. Not. A note, on the first anniversary of the Six Day War, RFK was murdered, allegedly by a Palestinian. Uh-huh. 
The Kennedys had put pressure on the American Zionist Council for Public Affairs, now known as APAC, American Israel Public Affairs Committee. In 1963, the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations hearings revealed that the American Zionist Council had laundered over $5 million of Jewish agency funds into lobbying activities. The American Zionist Council simply dodged the Foreign Agent Registration Act order by moving all of its major functions to APAC, and umbrella organizations like the ZOA and Hadash became permanent members of APAC's executive committee. Once Johnson was in office, Israel had an unchecked foreign lobby with no resistance, free to bribe their way into further power. APAC is currently the most powerful lobby in DC. Now, to pick up on Grant's comments, he indicated that it may help in the United States because it allows policymakers in Washington uh, to pretend uh, that Israel doesn't have nuclear weapons. Uh, and he was complaining about the fact that it, uh, this policy of opacity undermines accountability. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think it matters much at all because there's no accountability for Israel on any issue. They don't need opacity. <laughs> Listen, if I went to the Middle East and visited Israel and I was killed, somebody shot me there, do you think there'd be any accountability? Seriously. If any of you went to the Middle East and were killed, do you think there'd be accountability? There wouldn't be. This is how outrageous this situation is. Just think about the liberty. Think about Rachel Corey. Think about this Turkish American who was just killed in the flotilla. There's no accountability. The Israelis can do almost anything and get away with it. So the idea that opacity matters, I don't think so. The lobby basically believes it can finesse any issue. They've never seen an issue that they can't finesse. Look at what they did with the Goldstone report. Judge Goldstone, right? I followed this issue very carefully. And he asked me to put my strategist hat on. As many of you know, I went to West Point. I was in the military for 10 years. And I cut my teeth in this business by doing military matters. The first time I ever went to Israel was to study what happened in 67, 73, and actually the 56 wars. And I can tell you in great detail how those wars were fought. I followed what happened in, in, in Gaza in 2008, 2009. Judge Goldstone, if anything, was too soft on the Israelis. Anybody who followed this carefully knows that he basically got the story right. And again, to the extent it was wrong, he should have been tougher on the Israelis. You saw what happened to Judge Goldstone. This is how powerful the lobby is. Alan Dershowitz was correct, right, when he said that Jews of my generation created what is perhaps the most powerful interest group in the history of democracy. Right? Uh, remarkably powerful interest group. People say Jews are too powerful, we're too strong, we're too rich, we control the media. We have too much this, we have too much that. And we often apologetically deny our strength and our power. Don't do that. Don't do that. We have earned the right to influence public debate. We have earned the right to be heard. We have contributed disproportionately to the success of this country. Never, ever apologize for using our strength and our influence in the interest of peace. And if you need a biblical source for it, just remember the psalmist who said, Hashem owes liamo yutain. God will give the Jewish people strength, owes. And then, only then, Hashem yivarech atamo b'shalom. Only then will God give the Jewish people peace. Peace will come for the Jewish people and the Jewish nation only through strength. Never apologize for using your strength. It wasn't like the Nubek operation was some super smooth criminal op that was impossible to detect. They were sloppy. Literally. They got caught. The power wasn't in the logistics of the operation, but in the uncanny ability to cover it up. Later, Seaborg wrote a number of books, and he wrote three of them that were memoirs where he discussed uh, Numek. 
And in one of them, he, he said, uh, what good would it do to admit that HEU had been stolen and given to Israel? <laughs> he denied that it happened, but he said, what good would it do? As early as 1966, the Atomic Energy Commission was aware that 392 pounds of highly enriched uranium was missing from the Numec plant. It only takes about 33 pounds to make an atomic bomb. Apollo is littered with radioactive material and the current cost of cleaning it up is half a billion dollars or about one eighth of what the U.S. gives to Israel in aid every year. Yes, we actually pay the country that robs and attacks us. The effect of Israel stealing the bomb goes beyond nuclear proliferation. Every Cretan from religious fanatics to mafia bosses benefited from the U.S.'s unwillingness to act. My fellow citizens, at this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. On my orders, coalition forces have begun striking selected targets of military importance to undermine Saddam Hussein's ability to wage war. On my orders, there never would have been an Office of Special Plans comprised of Zionist neocons who dragged us into a war in Iraq. There never would have been a proxy war covertly aiding Al-Qaeda in Syria or sanctions on Russia and Iran if this Zionist grip on power had broken in its early years. The extent of the New Met crime uncovered new horrors in the 1980s when it was discovered that one of the Israeli spies, Raphael Adenton, who along with Efron Bigham, Abraham Hermione, and Ebrahan Bindor, met with Zalman Shapiro at Numec under the cover of being thermoelectric generator specialist, was the handler for Jonathan Pollard. In uh, 1968, these four Israeli spies showed up at Numec. And um, just briefly, uh, Avraham Hermoni was the Lackham chief in the United States. He um, uh, recruited a number of spies for Israel in the nuclear program. He went back to Raphael, where he was a deputy director of that weapons effort in Israel. Ephraim Begun was um, uh, sort of the technician of Shin Bet, the Israeli FBI. Abraham Bender went on to be the head of Shin Bet. Raphael Etan went on to be the head of Lackham and recruited and ran Jonathan Pollard in the United States. Jonathan Pollard was sentenced to life in prison for giving U.S. secrets to Israel, including the U.S.'s first strike plans against the Soviet Union. He is the most damaging spy ever caught in U.S. history. Yet after 30 years, he was out on parole, and when that expired, he was flown to Israel on a private jet owned by Zionist billionaire Sheldon Adelson. He received a hero's welcome. What would Israel want to do with the U.S.'s first strike plans? What value was it to them other than to exchange it for something from the Soviet Union? Raphael Adenton was the founder of Lakam, Economic Espionage Network for Israel. To this day, the official U.S. policy on Israel's well-known nuclear weapons is as silly as the denial of Taiwan's sovereignty. Everyone knows they exist, yet the government pretends it's invisible. Even though Israel made an offer to sell nuclear-tipped Jericho missiles to South Africa, PW Bother only pulled out of that deal, by the way, because of the price, Israel is not a signatory to the NPT, Non-Proliferation Treaty, nor will it ever be asked to be. Allowing the apartheid regime to dictate U.S. policy has been toxic. This position of nuclear ambiguity is made all the more asinine by the fact that whistleblowers have photographed their warheads and shown the world. 
In typical fashion, the whistleblowers go to jail if any of their information involves Israel, and the criminals run free. Despite the well-established and well-known precedents of Zionists smuggling and stealing boatloads of armaments from the United States, and the indisputable evidence of Israeli intelligence agents regularly meeting with Zalman Shapiro in Pennsylvania, a dedicated and committed Zionist with ties to the Israeli government, as well as hundreds of kilos of highly enriched uranium being reported missing from New Mech and unaccounted for, the highest out of every commercial plant in the United States, and Israel having a covert nuclear program which they lie about at every turn, undermine inspections of, and the very suspicious samples at Dimona of highly enriched uranium that was measured with scientific certainty which the Israelis by themselves could not develop, the notion that highly enriched uranium was diverted from the United States to Israel was challenged. He related that when he entered the loading dock area on this particular evening, he noticed a flatbed truck backed up to the loading dock with some strange equipment on it. He described the equipment as several steel cabinets with some kind of gauges on the front of them and other equipment. He opined the equipment may have come from the pelletizer area, of which he was not familiar. He advised he then noticed the Numic owner, Dr. Salman Shapiro, pacing around the loading dock while were loading stove pipes into the steel cabinet type equipment that he observed on the truck. He stated that the stove pipes are cylindrical storage containers used to store canisters of high enriched materials in the vaults located at the Apollo nuclear facility. He stated that the stove pipes contained three or four canisters which were described as highly polished aluminum with standard printed square yellow labels approximately three inches in diameter by six inches tall that normally are used to store high enriched uranium products which he defined as 95% uranium. He advised he was sure this was high enriched uranium products due to the size and shape of the container and the labeling. He stated that the containers he used in the low enriched area were much larger than the canisters he observed and used a different label. He further advised that the route the workmen transporting the stove pipes used took them away from the low enriched area and brought them onto the dock through a different door. The low enriched materials vaults were located approximately 50 feet from the dock area down an angled corridor. He said the normal route for high enriched materials from the high enriched vaults was down the same corridor where the low enriched vaults were located. He said he noticed that the destination for the equipment on the truck was Israel and that it was transported by a ship. He stated that after he had quickly read the information contained on the shipping order, Redacted grabbed the clipboard away from him, telling him in words to the effect that the material contained in the shipping order was confidential and not for his eyes. He advised that shortly thereafter an armed guard ordered him off the loading dock. He stated that he did not observe anybody call the armed guard nor did he see the guard on the dock but that he believed the guard came from one of the hallways adjoining the dock. He further advised that it was highly unusual to see Dr. Shapiro in the manufacturing section of the Apollo nuclear facility. It was unusual to see Dr. Shapiro there at night and very unusual to see Dr. Shapiro so nervous as to pace around. He advised he had not come forward because he had a large family to support 
and the day following the incident, the plant personnel manager of New Mech threatened to fire him if he did not keep his mouth shut. Concerning what he had seen on the loading dock the night before, he further advised he mentioned the threat he received from the personnel manager to his union steward, whereupon he claims he was visited by some union goons from Kitanning, Pennsylvania, and again told him to keep his mouth shut. Seymour Hirsch, an award-winning journalist that covered the stories of the My Lai Massacre in Vietnam and Abu Ghraib prison scandal in Iraq, concluded in his book, The Samson Option, that Carl Duckett's assessment that Israel developed nuclear weapons with highly enriched uranium stolen from the United States was incorrect. Quote, Zalman Shapiro did not divert uranium from his processing plant, New Mech, to Israel. The missing uranium was not stolen at all. It ended up in the air and the water of the city of Apollo, as well as in the ducts, tubes, and floors of the New Mech plant. End quote. Yes, much of it did end up in those areas. However, much of it was also diverted to Israel. According to the Department of Energy, in an extensive audit in 2001 where they took all the records they could lay their hands on, they calculated that New Mex materials unaccounted for uh, were massive and that the highest losses occurred between 1966 and 1968, not even this earlier period where they were mishandling contracts. That in total, 269 kilograms of U-235 were lost between 57 and 68, and only 76 kilograms lost after 1969 and 1978. Now, the common denominator here is when Zalman Shapiro was actually in charge of the operation. During his reign, they lost about 2% of the U-235. Subsequently, after he moved on, they lost about 0.2%. And this is in spite of the fact that, according to the DOE, total throughput went up. So Arco and Babcock and Wilcox were handling more material and losing less of it, according to the Department of Energy 2001 audit. And Numec, even though it was tiny, won the American record for U-235 losses, nearly twice the amount of other companies in the same industries, cohort organizations, according to the Energy Department. Now, what you hear from defenders of Zalman Shapiro and Numec is that, and Seymour Hirsch, who even though he interviewed Abraham Feinberg, never knew that he was actually the nuclear funding coordinator. Don't know how he missed that. But you hear from Hirsch and others uh, in his famous book, The Samson Option, that all of the material was recovered when Babcock and Wilcox uh, took the plant apart. And it's true that 95 kilograms, according to the Energy Department, were recovered. But that wasn't all that was missing. This still leaves, to this day, a balance of 337 kilos. kilos. And this is discounting processing losses, sloppy operations, everything. So the outstanding balance is 337 kilograms. Seymour Hirsch further asserts, Duckett and the other government investigators into Numec acknowledged that there was no meaningful correlation between the uranium processed in the Numec plant and the traces of enriched uranium picked up by American agents outside Demona. Roger J. Matson, a trained scientist who has served in the Atomic Energy Commission, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the Environmental Protection Agency, has consulted on nuclear safety and security matters in his professional career and in 1976 led a Nuclear Regulatory Commission task force addressing the Numec affair, goes to great length in his book, Stealing the Atomic Bomb, How Denial and Deception Armed Israel, debunking that claim made by Seymour Hirsch. Among the many points Matson brings up to refute Hirsch, the most salient are the facts that only five countries, France, Britain, Russia, China, and the United States, were able to enrich uranium at that time, and more importantly, the samples of uranium found at Demona matched the highly enriched uranium that was developed in the Portsmouth plant, which was supplying Zalman Shapiro's Numec plant.
and this particular signature had a 97.7 enrichment of isotope uranium-235 and was supposed to be used as naval fuel for nuclear submarines. Coupled with high losses of highly enriched uranium from Numec that was unaccounted for, its ties to Israel, there is of course a correlation between Demona and Numec, contrary to what Hirsch claims. It ought to be mentioned that this information became public knowledge in 2006 and Hirsch published his book in 1991. Also in Hirsch's book, he cites interviews he did with Salman Shapiro himself. Shapiro claims that the meetings he had with Israeli officials at his house were merely about issues of protecting Israel's water supplies. Uh-huh. There is a massive precedent of Israelis stealing technology from the United States with impunity. This is, however, not limited to the United States. Related to Israel's nuclear program, in 1968, the Mossad carried out an illegal, covert, dangerous operation where through front company, they smuggled 200 tons of yellow cake uranium from Europe to Israel. They transported the yellow cake in a ship and then transferred the massive quantities of yellow cake to another vessel in a ship-to-ship -ship cargo transfer in the middle of the Eastern Mediterranean. The operation was called Operation Plumbat. In the 1980s, the Israelis were again caught violating U.S. export laws by illegally smuggling 800 nuclear weapons triggers, Krytron triggers, switches that in a matter of nanoseconds can detonate a nuclear bomb from the United States. It was carried out by Lakam, which was headed by Raphael Adenton, who repeatedly met with Zalman Shapiro and was the handler for the notorious spy Jonathan Pollard. The smuggling operations leader was Richard Kelly Smythe, and it was done covertly by moving Krytron triggers through a network consisting of several Israeli-affiliated front companies. One of the front companies was Heli Trading, which was owned by Arnan Milchan, a prominent Hollywood producer and billionaire who bragged about being an Israeli spy. The Israeli Ministry of Defense would purchase the Krytron triggers from its own front company. Arnan Milchan, a self-admitted spy and arms smuggler for Israel, openly boasted about his actions. Now a new tale of international intrigue is coming to light. This one about film producer Arnon Milchan. His double life was a not so closely held secret for decades. In a recent interview for an Israeli documentary, Milchan confirmed what had been rumored for years. He was working for Israel's top spy agency all along. Mayor Daron spent months interviewing Arnon Milchan for a book he co-wrote two years ago about the producer's secret life. He basically told us about like secretive operations that he did for the state of Israel, especially in order to get material, information, equipments for the Israeli nuclear program. In 2000, Milchan told 60 Minutes how he used dozens of his companies around the world to facilitate sales of hundreds of millions of dollars of missiles and other weapons to Israel. And he flat out denied working for the Israeli government. Was I a spy? No, I was not a spy. Milchan now says he was integral to developing Israel's nuclear program. One thing I regret is not paying enough attention to the image of me I created. Do you know to what extent I've risked my life for the country time and time again? And in Hollywood, they keep on saying arms dealer after more than 150 films. them. I did it for my country and I'm proud of it. You know that the years that you were doing King of Comedy and Once Upon a Time in America were perhaps the most dramatic years for him yes. in that respect. Yes. I did ask him once, we spoke about something and he told me um, that he was an Israeli and that he, f and that he uh, of course would do these things for his country. There's something with the little the little, the things that trigger a sort yeah, of quite thing. thing. I remember at some point I had asked Arnon about that, uh, being friends. I, I was curious, but not in an accusatory way. I just wanted to know. And uh, he, he said, yeah, I, I did. I'm Israeli. I, that's my country. I, I, you know. Israel basically built all her centrifugas to enrich uranium based on information that uh, Milchan collected for them. So this information that the Israeli government used to build these nuclear centrifuges mm -hmm. was obtained from his spying? 
Yes, absolutely, directly. Shimon Perez, the co-architect of Israel's nuclear program, proudly bragged about personally recruiting Arnon Milchan in the 60s to Lakan. The foremost Zionist psychopath Benjamin Netanyahu himself worked for Heli Trading at the time and met with Smythe as the operation was being carried out. According to FBI reports, Smythe and Netanyahu would meet in restaurants in Tel Aviv and in Netanyahu's home or business. It was not uncommon for Netanyahu to ask Smythe for unclassified material. Richard Kelly Smythe was finally captured in 2002, but Benjamin Netanyahu and billionaire Arnan Milchan got away with it, no problem. In fact, the House of Representatives unanimously received Netanyahu in Congress for the exuberance of fanatical cultists. The Prime Minister of Israel, His Excellency Benjamin Netanyahu. I want to thank you, Democrats and Republicans, for your common support for Israel, year after year, decade after decade. I know that no matter on which side of the aisle you sit, you stand with Israel. Before Julian Assange, there was Mordecai Venunu. Venunu worked at the Negev Nuclear Research Center south of Dimona. He was politically opposed to Israel's 1982 war with Lebanon. In 1985, he secretly brought a camera into the research center and covertly took 57 damning pictures of Israel's nuclear weapons. There was no World Wide Web in 1985, so he needed to go to the papers, but certainly not in Israel. He traveled to Australia. Converting to Christianity in 1986, he promised to sell his story and give the proceeds to his church, then in Australia. He traveled to the UK with an independent Colombian journalist and a journalist for the Sunday Times. He also gave detailed descriptions for the process of creating tritium and a method for lithium-6 separation in addition to his photographs. As the Times was verifying his story, the Colombian sold the story to the Sunday Mirror. Mistake. The Sunday Mirror was owned by the now infamous Robert Maxwell, the father of Glenn Maxwell, the convicted child trafficker who worked with Jeffrey Epstein in Wexner's blackmail ring. Maxwell already working with Israeli military intelligence tipped off the Mossad. They created a honey trap. Eight years his younger, Cheryl Bentoff, a Mossad agent posing as Sydney, a fiery red-headed American tourist enticed Venunu to travel to Rome with her on holiday. At an apartment there, Venunu was jumped, drugged, and smuggled to Israel. There was a closed-door trial and he was put in prison, 11 years of which were in solitary confinement. In 2015, the National Security Archive of George Washington University published documents that corroborated Venunu's claims and evidence. Did the U.S. government or media care? Nope. The U.S. government and media will not even acknowledge the ongoing house demolitions and annexation of Palestine. If you press that on establishment social media, they'll ban you faster than a Hunter Biden laptop story. America does not have a free press or free speech. And none of this would be the way it is if this man had lived. Can you uh, give uh, great care and attention to? We should support uh, the laws that the United States has passed in order to protect us from uh, those who would destroy us from within. 
The murder of American President John F. Kennedy brought to an abrupt end the massive pressure being applied by the U.S. administration on the government of Israel. Had Kennedy remained alive, it is doubtful whether Israel would today have a nuclear option. We wouldn't have a Middle East like we have today if John F. Kennedy's policies had been pursued and if he had not died on November 22nd. But it's really interesting about Mordecai Venuno. You know, it was in 1986 is when he blew the whistle on Israeli nuclear weapons. I found out that Venunu had actually said, he actually alleged that there was a link between the JFK assassination and the 1967 war that Israel launched against its Arab neighbors. When, when Venunu was released from prison under, under some great uh, sanctions uh, uh, by the Israelis, lim limiting his contact and so forth, with people, he made a public assertion that he believed that supporters of Israel's nuclear weapons program were in fact involved in the JFK assassination uh, precisely because of JFK's efforts to stop Israel from building the nuclear bomb.